Happy Fourth of July. And uh, when I laid out the preaching calendar a few months ago, I didn't realize the significance of preaching this particular text on this particular day, but I think we're going to find it timely and appropriate. Because as we celebrate our freedom from tyranny, we come to a passage that shows a people who deal with tyranny on a civil level and idolatry in the spiritual realm. And we'll see the destruction that when both of those get combined and then overtake a particular people. All the action revolves around a man named Abimelech. This is a longer passage, so I want to lay out where we're going. Um, First, we'll see kind of the beginnings of Abimelech, who he is, the situation that he was born into. Then we're going to see his ascent into power, and then we'll see his fall from that power. So let's get into it. We're in Judges chapter 8, slowly making our way through the book of Judges. Um, But we are in chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 29. And this is the kind of end of Gideon that we've been looking at for the last few weeks. So let's look at Judges chapter 8, verse 29. Jeroboam, that's Gideon, that's the name he was given. Jeroboam, the son of Joash, went to live in his own house. Now Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, at Ophrah of the Abiezrites. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal Bereth their god. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. Now we can't really understand who Abimelech is and what he tries to do in this passage unless we remember the end of his father's life. Gideon, as we saw in the last few chapters, was the judge who delivered God's people from the Midianites. Remember, they would um, keep invading the land for seven years, coming right at harvest time and taking the food, taking the animals, taking the means that they had for farming, and then, then scatter again. And they kept doing this again and again and again. And God used Gideon to deliver them. He defeated the Midianites. When we left off last week, the people came to Gideon and said, we want you to be our king. And Gideon said, no, God is your king. I'm not going to be your king. My son's not going to be your king. God is your king. And then he went to live in his own house and seemingly retire. But did you notice in the passage we just read the kind of life that he lived? He had many wives. He had concubines, which were kind of second tier wives. And through these, he had 70 sons. And one of these he named Abimelech. And Abimelech in Hebrew means something like my father is king or the son of a king. And so the picture is the picture is pretty clear. Gideon told the people, I'm not going to be your king, my son's not going to be your king, but he kind of lived like he was. And then he died. And following the pattern so far in the book of Judges. God uses a judge to deliver the people and bring peace, but as soon as that judge dies, the people go astray again. This time, the people, uh, Gideon dies, the people have peace, 40 years of rest, but as soon as Gideon dies, what, is, what happens? They follow after other gods. This time, specifically, uh, they make this god Baal Bereth, which meant something like Baal of the Covenant. So, They're taking the idea of their God, the God of the covenant, Yahweh, and they're ascribing some of his attributes to the God of the Canaanites, Baal. But as I mentioned last week, this this pattern in the book of Judges of idolatry, then uh, invaders come in, take over the people, they cry out for help, God sends a deliverer, he delivers the people, and then there's rest. This cycle starts to break down at the end of Gideon's life. 
This is the last time, I mentioned this last week, this is the last time there is rest mentioned in the book of Judges. After Gideon, the land gets no more rest. And this time, when the people chase after idols and make Baal Bereth their God, God does not send foreign invaders to come into the land and take over. Instead, he lets them destroy themselves from within. And his primary uh, instrument for doing that is Abimelech. Chapter 9. Look at verse 1. Now Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, again that's Gideon, went to Shechem to his mother's relatives and said to them, and to the whole clan of his mother's family, Say in the, hear, in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jeroboam rule over you, or that one rule over you? Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's relatives spoke all these words on his behalf in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem. And their hearts were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. And they gave him 70 pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bereth, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. And he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Jeroboam, 70 men on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. And all the leaders of Shechem came together, and all Beth Melo, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar at Shechem. Now, the cunning of Abimelech is on display here. He goes to his hometown, a place that would be favorable to him, gets his relatives to campaign for him. But did you see how he campaigned? His campaign strategy was to create a false narrative and then have the people react to that. So Gideon was the de facto leader of Israel. He's dead. Who's going to lead in his place? Now, we're not told that anyone in Israel was actually asking that question. We're not told. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but we're not told. They, they weren't sitting there saying, well, who's going to be our leader now? Up to this point, God had appointed Moses to be the leader. God had appointed Joshua to take them into the land. But after that, God was to be their king. God was to be their leader. He was the one to be directing everything. It was never up to the people to pick their leader. And so Abimelech, through his family, through his relatives, says, Gideon's gone. You know what's going to happen? These 70 men are going to come, and they're going to rule you. They're going to take over. They're not even from here. Whereas Abimelech, he's from Shechem. He's one of us. He can rule, but it's clear from the context that he doesn't just want them to pick him over his brothers. He wants his brothers out of the picture completely, which is what he does. Notice they pay him out of the treasury or made out of the offerings of their god, Baal Bereth. Seventy pieces of silver, one piece of silver for every brother. And he uses it to hire worthless and reckless fellows. And they help Abimelech kill his brothers. Then the people of Shechem make him their king. Now, now look at the progression that happens here. Abimelech uses a false narrative, gets the people to, 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 to answer to that issue. He uses his clan and his family to emotionally manipulate the people of the city to do what he wants. All the while, idolatry is taking place. And then in the middle of that idolatry, he hires ungodly, worthless men to help him do an ungodly thing, all to build up a kingdom for himself. And the people happily go after it. I have a friend who a while back was at a church, and their church was going through a, a pastoral transition. Their pastor had, had left. They were looking for a new one. And the search committee finally narrowed it down. We have our guy. This is the one he wants. He's an incredible preacher, incredible leader. And so they pull him in, and they make the offer to him. And this candidating pastor said, I will come, and I will lead your church on one condition. I get final say on everything. Whether it's staffing, whether it's budget, whether it's vision, no matter what it is, I get to have the last say. The deacons don't answer to you. They answer to me. And the search committee said, okay, let's do it. And I asked my friend, 
how could this man, what sort of pastor goes in and demands something like that? Why would a man ask for that much control within the church? And my friend said, you're asking the wrong question. You can't put this on the pastor. Instead, what sort of search committee gives him that much power? What sort of church entrusts so much to a man who's obviously trying to grab for it? Now, in reality, both were the problem, right? The church wanted a leader who could take them down the road of earthly success. They wanted a man who could draw a big crowd and and get a big budget and gain popularity and fame in their city. And the pastor wanted to be able to make a name for himself as the person who did it. When the people of God take their eyes off of God, when knowing him and, and making him known stops being the goal, then you have nothing left except what the world says is good and right. When you take your eyes off of the goal of knowing God and making him known, and that being the driving factor between and in the people of God, then what you have left is a standard that the world gives. And when you get to that place, you will ignore sinful tendencies and ungodly character if that leader will help you get what you want. And this is prevalent today. People in churches are driven by the false narrative. It's not a true thing. It's a false narrative, and it's this. Unbelievers won't come to your church unless you have something that they are attracted to. They won't come unless they're going to have fun, unless they enjoy it. And so our job then is to make it attractive and fun. So everything from the music to the programs have to be centered on what these unbelievers like or what? What will they say? Your church won't grow. And so if that's the goal, just to get the church to grow, get people in, no matter what cost, if that's the goal, then the means to accomplish it becomes, where is the leader who can help the church think like an unbeliever? And then they hire whatever pastor can do these things. And then he takes the church's money and hires people with practical abilities and knowledge of marketing and business savvy and pays little regard to their character. And before you know it, the church looks like the world. It has worldly success, and its leaders, either secretly or publicly, are embroiled in scandal. You see this everywhere. And it's the same sort of thing happening in Judges 9. The people elect Abimelech to be their king. He kills his brothers, and they make him king. But one brother's escaped. The youngest son of Gideon, his name is Jotham. Look at verse 7. When it was told to Jotham, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim and cried aloud and said to them, Listen to me, you leaders of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees once went out to anoint a king over them, and they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, shall I leave my abundance by which gods and men are honored and go hold sway over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, you come and reign over us. But the fig tree said, shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit and go hold over, hold sway over the trees? And the tree said to the vine, you come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, shall I leave my wine that cheers God and men and go hold sway over the trees? Then the tree said to the bramble, you come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, if in good faith you're anointing me king over you, then come take refuge in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So Jotham stands up and he gives them a parable. I read one thing that said this is the first parable in the Bible. And he says, picture this forest, right? A bunch of trees. And and they say, we want a leader. We want a king. And so they ask an olive tree, then a fig tree, and then a, a, a grapevine to be their leader. But these honorable trees say no. Each one in turn says, we already have a purpose, and our purpose isn't to rule over you. Then it goes to a bramble bush, which says, come on. 
Now, the point of all of this is to point out the foolishness of the people of Shechem in choosing Abimelech to be their king. The forest goes to this bramble bush and says, lead us. A forest of trees. I mean, get the mental picture in your head. It's supposed to be absurd. A forest goes to a bramble bush and says, lead us. A bush that is nothing but thorns. A bush that does nothing but choke out and kill the other plant life around it. That sort of bush can't lead a tree. Further, when the bush says, hey, you guys come and live under my shade, a bramble bush doesn't provide shade. It doesn't have any leaves. It's nothing but bramble. The only possible way for a forest or even a tree to find shade under a bramble bush is for it to be cut into pieces and laid down. And that's the main idea. I mean, let's listen to Jotham's application. He's, he's going to tell us what he means. Look at verse 16. Now, therefore, if you acted in good faith and integrity when you made Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jeroboam and his house, and have done to him as his deeds deserved, for my father fought for you and risked his life and delivered you from the hand of Midian, and you have risen up against my father's house today and have killed his son, 70 men on one stone, and have made Abimelech, the son of his female servant, king over the leaders of Shechem, because he's your relative. If you then have acted in good faith and integrity with Jeroboam and his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out of a Come out from Abimelech and devour the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come from the leaders of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beir and lived there because of Abimelech, his brother. So you hear the main idea of this parable coming through in Jotham's speech. He, he tells the leaders of Shechem, if you acted in good faith and integrity when you made a Gideon, your, Gideon your king, I um, uh, made Abimelech your king, who went against Gideon, Gideon who killed his sons, the, the same man who saved you, if you did this in good faith and integrity, may all be well. Good. Rejoice in it. But if it was not in good faith and integrity, then there's a curse upon you. And the curse that he lays out is twofold. First, he says fire will come from Abimelech and destroy Shechem, the people who made him king. And second, a fire will come from Shechem and kill, devour Abimelech. If your heart and your motives weren't right, then you will end up destroying each other. That's the curse that Jotham lays out. Now that's what Jotham thinks. But next, the narrator, the writer of the book of Judges, Let's us see behind the curtain of God's providence to show us what's really going on. Look at verse 22. Abimelech ruled over Israel three years, and God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. And the leaders of Shechem dwelt treacherously with Abimelech, that the violence done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam might come. And their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them. And on the men of Shechem, who strengthened his hands to kill his brothers. And the leaders of Shechem put men in ambush against him on the mountaintops. And they robbed all who passed by them along the way. And it was told to Abimelech. I can't remember where I heard it. I think it was C. Gene Wilkes in one of his books said said this. Anything that begins in anger and rebellion will always end in anger and rebellion. And we see that on display here. Three years, Abimelech is in charge. And after three years, the leaders of Shechem decide, we don't want this guy anymore. We don't want Abimelech to be our king. But we as the readers are given clues as to why they changed their mind. Because God sent this evil spirit. Now when reading this, this could be alarming to us. God sent an evil spirit? I mean, if God's not evil, how can he do anything that is evil? How can he do anything that even involves evil? And it all hinges on how we interpret this phrase, evil spirit. It could be that God, as the sovereign of the universe, commands an evil spirit to do something, and because he's holy and righteous, God is not evil when he commands him to do it. Right? Think about Jesus and, and uh, 
telling and letting the evil spirit leave the uh, demon-possessed man, and it goes in and, and goes into a, a herd of pigs instead, right? And the pigs go off and kill themselves, right? It's not a good thing, is it? And yet Jesus was commanding the evil spirit, go do what you were intended to do. And yet Jesus was not evil in doing it. It could be something similar here. It could be an evil spirit that God is saying, you do what you are intended to do, but it does not make God evil in commanding him to do it. Or it could be that this is merely a spirit of divisiveness that God puts between two evil parties. Evil party A, evil party B, God says, hey, y'all are going to fight each other. And so Shechem was evil, Abimelech was evil. The spirit is sent to ensure that they don't get along. Either way, it's clear from the context that God isn't doing anything wrong in this. That charge can't be brought against him. So what happens is the leaders get tired of Abimelech and they lay a trap for him. But did you notice that they don't really care who they catch? They start robbing everyone who comes along. And so remember, Midian was coming in and stealing all of their food and stealing their animals, right? A foreign invader that Gideon drove out. Now it's happening among their own people. Then Abimelech finds out about it. Verse 26. And Gaal, the son of Ebed, moved into Shechem with his relatives. And the leaders of Shechem put confidence in him. And they went out into the field and gathered grapes from their vineyards and trod on them and had a festival and they went into the house of their God and ate and drank and reviled Abimelech. And Gaal, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech? And who are we of Shechem that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jeroboam? Is not Zebel his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. But why should we serve him? Would that this people were under my hand? Then I would remove Abimelech. I would say to Abimelech, Increase your army and come out. So, this guy, Gaal, pulls an Abimelech. He goes into Shechem and says, hey, you don't want that guy leading over you. You know who'd be better? Me. And he traces their family lineage all the way back to, oh, Shechem's father uh, was Hamor, and, and I'm of that line, so hey, come on. I, I have a better claim on this than, than Abimelech does. And they go for it, which shows how moronic and fickle the people of Shechem are, but but a quick reminder of the major players. You know Abimelech. We've been talking about him. Abimelech put his number two man, his next guy in charge, his name is Zebel, as mayor of the city of Shechem. Then you have this new guy, Gaal, come. He's the newcomer to Shechem, and he's trying to get rid of Abimelech and Zebel. Verse 30. When Zebel, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaal, the son of Ebed, his anger was kindled. And he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly, saying, Behold, Gaal, the son of Ebed, and his relatives have come to Shechem, and they're stirring up the city against you. Now, therefore, go by night, you and the people who are with you, and set an ambush in the field. Then in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, rise early, rush upon the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may do to them as your hand finds to do. So Abimelech and all the men who were with him rose up by night and set an ambush against Shechem and four companies. And Gaal, the son of Ebed, went out and stood in the entrance of the gate of the city, and Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from the ambush. And when Gaal saw the people, he said to Zebel, Look, people are coming down from the mountaintops. And Zebel said to him, You mistake the shadow of the mountains for men. Gaal spoke again and said, Look, people are coming down from the center of the land. One company is coming from the direction of the diviner's oak. Then Zebel said to him, Where is your mouth now? You who said... Who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Are not these the people whom you despised? Go out now and fight with them. And Gaal went out at the head of the leaders of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him, and many fell wounded up to the entrance of the gate. And Abimelech lived at Aramah, and Zebel drove out Gaal and his relatives so that they could not dwell at Shechem. So the battle is over. The leaders of Shechem who fought against Abimelech, they're either dead or driven away. He's reasserted his authority in Shechem. The king has regained his throne. It's all done, right? No. Look what he does. Verse 42. On the following day, 
the people went out of the field, and Abimelech was told. He and his people, he took his people and divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the fields. And, and he looked and saw the people coming out of the city, so he rose against them and killed them. Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city while the two companies rushed upon all who were in the field and killed them. And Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He captured the city and killed the people who were in it. He raised the city and sowed it with salt. When all the leaders of the tower of Shechem heard it, they entered the strong house, the stronghold of the house of el -Bareth. Abimelech was told that all the leaders of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. And Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people who were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bundle of brushwood and took it up and laid it on his shoulder. And he said to the men who were with him, what you've seen me do, hurry and do as I've done. So every one of the people cut down his bundle, and following Abimelech, put it against the stronghold, and they set the stronghold on fire over them, so that all the people of the tower of Shechem also died, about a thousand men and women. Notice here that Abimelech was not happy with justice. We can put that in air quotes, right? He's not content with merely punishing the people who fought against him. He kills everybody. He raises the entire city. Now catch the weight of this. This is his own hometown. He went to them saying, hey, I'm your man. We're one people. We're one group. I'm one of you. And yet, his spite, his desire, his desire for revenge was so great, he would turn on his own and he destroyed everyone. Now, this shouldn't surprise us. I mean, a man who's willing to kill 70 of his own brothers to be able to get the throne will not stop at killing everybody to keep that throne. And at the heart of Abimelech wasn't this desire to lead God's people. He, he wasn't trying to, to lead them with wisdom further on into holiness. His starting place was jealousy. He felt that his conditions of life and his, his circumstances around his birth and the family he was born into and the, the town that he was born into, all of these things, he was jealous. He wanted what his brothers had. And with that as his motivation, with, with jealousy as his motivation, nothing would satisfy him except complete allegiance. But Abimelech's rampage isn't done yet. Fear and unrighteous anger and jealousy are never satisfied, no matter what happens. They always want more. So Abimelech keeps going. Shechem, gone. Where is the next town? So he goes to Thebes, Thebes, which is 10 miles away, and tries to do the same thing. Look at verse 50. Then Abimelech went to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower within the city, and all the men and women and all the leaders of the city fled to it and shut themselves in, and they went up to the roof of, roof of the tower. And Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and drew near to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, lest they say of me, a woman killed him. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, everyone departed to his own home. So the curse that Jotham laid out earlier in the parable of the trees came true. Abimelech and his followers were killed by the people of Shechem, and he killed the people of Shechem. They kill each other. Now, there's so much in this passage that we can apply to our situation today. One I've already mentioned. You had a spiteful, jealous, power-hungry man who used God's people to serve his own purposes. And then you had the people reject God's leadership in favor of a worldly way of thinking. And there was something compelling about Abimelech. He was shrewd. He had ability. He brought worldly victories. And we, as the people of God today, should be very careful about thinking too harshly about the people of Shechem. I mean, we can judge them, right? We see in here that they were wrong. Scripture's clear that they were wrong. 
But before we pile on them for their sin, we should stop and ask ourselves, have we here in America done the same? Whether in the church, with pastors or leaders or celebrities, whichever celebrity of the month is claiming to be a Christian, or with the secular government, have we been quick to align ourselves with, to use Jotham's words, a bramble leader? Someone who's compelling and shrewd, someone who knows how the world works, and yet we ignore their character deficiencies, we ignore God's plan, and follow after someone who would happily burn the whole thing down just to serve his vengeance. I think we need to confront ourselves with our idolatry, particularly the, God, the, the idols, the gods of acceptance and popularity, control, We want so much to be liked by the world. We want so much to have some power over them. But what we need to remember is that Jesus is the head of the church, not any man. No pastor, no elder. We are under shepherds. Jesus is the shepherd. Jesus is the king. And he has already laid out his plan for the growth of his kingdom and for the growth of his church. And it will advance. It will grow. It will take over by the proclamation of the gospel and the people of God serving others with good deeds of love. And in the world's eyes, that's weak. That's foolish. Because we simply have the open statement that Jesus Christ died to save sinners. That he rose again on the third day to save sinners. That one day he is coming back. And so we don't need to have like a marketing, uh, a marketing campaign. We don't need to have business sense. We don't need to ask, what do unbelievers need to hear before they'll come to the church and like it? We need the gospel of Jesus powerfully on display in our lives. The people who love God with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and are willing to love everyone sacrificially like they love themselves. Now, I think that's an appropriate way to apply this text. I think that's something we can pull from here. However, that's not the main application of this text. That's not the main idea of this text. It's a point, but it's not the main point. To see the main point, let's look at our final text today, verse 56. Thus, God returned the evil of Abimelech which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made all the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. This whole account of Abimelech serves as a vehicle for God to deliver an important message. In the book of Judges, as we go on, it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer that there is no limit to the evil that men will do, even those that say they are God's people. It's as if, think of like the end of the book of Joshua, the beginning of the book of Judges is kind of like noontime, right? The sun is overhead, everything is clear, everything is perfect, but as you go through the book of Judges, it's like you're seeing one long sunset. Things get darker and darker and darker. And as they do, we're confronted with the question of where is God? Doesn't God see all of this darkness? Does God care that his people are giving themselves to idolatry? Does God care that sin and violence are becoming so prevalent among his people? Does God care? And the writer of the book of Judges makes it clear God does care. That though God will allow his people to experience the depths of their sins, those sins will by no means go unpunished. And we see something similar in Romans 1. Right? The people forget God, they fall in love with idols, And God essentially says, well, since that's what you want, I'm going to let you go that way. I'm going to let you go into your idolatry and experience the death that comes from that sin. And yet, as you see throughout Romans, as you see throughout the rest of the book of Judges, that sin will be paid for. 
There is not a single person who has ever existed on earth that will get away with evil, no matter how great or how small. But it makes us wonder why. Why does God do it that way? I mean, why couldn't God just step in and stop it? Why not stop Abimelech before he killed his 70 brothers? Why not stop the men of Shechem before they made him their king? Why not give them peace? Why not stop the people before they go to war with each other? And the answer, I think, is twofold. First, God wants us to see the destructive power of sin. He knows that we are forgetful people. It's so easily, it's so easy to be enticed by sin. I mean, sin promises greatness, it promises satisfaction, it promises pleasure, and it can never deliver on those promises. Abimelech wants to be king. He gets to be king, and he's not satisfied. The people of Shechem want a king, and they get the king they wanted, and they're not satisfied. Sin always overpromises and underdelivers. And the way of sin always leads to destruction. But as I said, we are a forgetful people. Proverbs 26:11, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. We need reminders like Proverbs 16:25, there is a way that lead that seems right to a man but it is the way that leads to death. If I go this way, we need to be warned, if I follow this path, destruction is waiting for me. And so God leaves these stories, these events, these events in our own lives as a way to remind us that sin brings death. But the presence of evil and the wreckage that it brings does something else as well it also makes us cry out for deliverance. Every day is a reminder that there is no man, there's no woman, humanity in general, it cannot save us. We live in a land of darkness, and we need a light that cannot come from the darkness. We need a light that we cannot ourselves give. We need healing in the midst of this sickness. We need life in this death. And so God lets us experience that darkness so we cry out for light. He lets us experience that death so that we can cry out for life. We are made to realize that only God can provide what we need. And so Abimelech here in Judges, and really all of the book of Judges, shows that there isn't a single man or woman in Israel who can ultimately and finally deliver God's people. The rest of the Old Testament shows there isn't a king alive, even a man like David who was God's friend, a man after God's own heart, even Solomon his son, who was given all the wisdom and knowledge of God. Even those men were sinners and ultimately could not save God's people. We need more than humanity can provide. Which is why God himself comes down. He lets us experience the depths of our sin. He lets us experience the destruction that sin brings. And then he himself comes down. He provides what we could never give, someone to deliver us from that sin. Someone to deliver us from that idolatry. Someone who will be able to bring us into the very presence of God himself. God sent his own son to be the judge. God sent his own son to, bring, to, to be the deliverer. God sent his own son to be our king. But we've got to give up the worldly way of thinking in order to get it. The Bible says we have to repent. We have to turn away from the worldly way of thinking. We have to turn away from our sins. We have to turn away from the way that seems right to us but leads to death and destruction. And we turn to Jesus and experience the forgiveness and the life and the light that he brings. And then and only then can we receive mercy that we don't deserve. Can we receive grace to overcome those sins and to overcome death? Jesus takes that punishment that we deserve on himself. Every sin will be paid for. 
either by you in the final judgment or if you're a believer by faith, you cling to Christ and you've forsaken the ways of the world, then that sin has already been paid for by Jesus in full. And we get to live with him forever. When we think of the tyranny that we've put upon ourselves, when we asked sin, like we the people of Shechem asked Abimelech, we the people of God have asked sin to be our ruler, sin to give us pleasure, sin to lead us. And we deserve to be destroyed. But God sent his son to deliver us from that so that we could be in his kingdom. 